Coming up on the Racing Insiders, the World Rally Championship wraps up for 2013. Rally Great Britain in Wales. We talk to the winners. We go to Macau. The Macau Grand Prix, we've got the Audi LMS Cup and the World Touring Car Championship. We talked to John Doonan, Director of Motorsports for Mazda, a great headline, a prototype from Mazda. And we get background on the Tudor United Sports Car Championship testing at Sebring and Daytona. That's next on The Racing Insiders. Welcome back to another edition of the Racing Insiders, the only place in broadcasting where you're going to get sports car content, fresh sports car content every week. I'm Bill Wood in Los Angeles. Jeff Lepper is with me in Folsom, California. What's up, Jeff? Yeah, thanks, Bill. Boy, we talk about the racing series and the racing season sort of winding down, but we still have a lot of action-packed stuff to talk about here this week. A lot of action, especially in Wales, Rally GB, the last event in the World Rally Championship this year. We already know that Sebastian Auger, Volkswagen, won the championship. Volkswagen is the manufacturer's champion. And look at these fans who are gathered around uh, Sebastian Auger getting autographs. It was kind of a coronation for him. But the action on the stages wasn't like a coronation. Nobody gave him the opportunity to run away with it. He was, had the early start, but his teammate, Yari Mari Latvala, closed on him and cut the uh, the lead down to 17 seconds. But OJ withstood that charge and on Saturday lit it up again and opened the lead back up, withstood the challenge from his uh, Latvala. Latvala ended up finishing second. It's exciting that... Uh, uh... Uh, Volkswagen Bolos are in, in the front, Sebastian Rogier leading, I'm second. Uh, it's been a good fight, but I'm just, I'm disappointed in my personal performance because this is one of the, my uh, like favorite events and I, I've done too many little mistakes today and I've been losing time and uh, that is annoying to me that I haven't been able to do like a clear, a clear stasis. So that is where I really need to improve for tomorrow. Actually, I was surprised by the difference because I was not really pushing but it looks like we had a really efficient driver I don't know I think also Yabri was not in confidence in the morning so he struggled a bit with that and uh, for us it was not the big attack but we had the confidence we had a good rhythm and yeah on the long stage like that uh, that makes difference he had a little bit of challenge Latvala did from Terry Newville who was running his last event in the M Sport Ford and he was challenged by Andreas Mickelson this event for third place between Latvala, Newville, and Mickelson. They were all battling for third. Mickelson was trying to make it an all Volkswagen podium, but he fell back, had some problems, and ended up with uh, Ogier and Latvala, one and two, and Newville was third, fourth was Latvala. A lot of eyes were on Citroen. Hervinen went out early. Listen to this. Miko Hervinen crashed, crashed bad because his co-driver, the Armo Lettinen, misread an instruction. He called out a six, which is a high speed, fast turn. It was supposed to be a five, just flat missed it. He said later, Lettinen said that he got out of the car, apologized profusely to Hervinen. Hervinen said, wait, how many times have I screwed up? And that's just how the two of them have to be able to work together through Hervinen out of the rally. The highest placing Citroen was Danny Sordo. Another problem with the Citroen team, they had a third car, Robert Kubisa, the WRC2 champion. He stepped up to the full WRC cars this week. He crashed on Friday, crashed again, went too fast in a ditch, rolled twice, and the car was done. He couldn't come back for Sunday. Kubisa had some problems. Jeff, it was a wild weekend. Yeah, you got to really feel for Cintron. You know, I think with uh, Hervinen's car, they said that the inside of the car was more muddy than the outside of the car after that huge crash that he had. <laughs> and Kubisa, man, you got to feel for that guy. He crashes out in stage one, gets the car fixed, crashes out in stage 11. I really think the car was repairable after the stage 11 crash, but I think more of the team just said, look, we're not going to do it again. <laughs> it's crazy. They had to put the whole car back together We've talked about co-drivers and drivers this week. You could see how important it is to have the two of them on the same page, on the same note. 
that in order to uh, show speed and go as fast as they can. You've heard the videos, this constant dialogue, all of those notes that the co-driver is reading has an importance to what kind of road it is, where it goes around the corner, how fast you should be going. These notes are written by the driver. The driver tells the co-driver what they say, although they kind of team together, but it's an important relationship. And I just, I, I can't get over that relationship between Hervin and, and Lepton and how the two of them just, you know, I screwed up. Don't worry about it. I screw up too. That's huge. Let's go to the Macau Grand Prix, a tradition at this time of the year for more than 50 years. And part of the racing that goes on, they have several races, open wheel GT touring car. We'll talk about that in a minute. But part of the thing is the Audi LMS Cup races. These are the GT3 customer cars from Audi that are similar to the cars that they use in the Pirelli World Challenge, aren't they, Jeff? Yeah, this year for 2013, those were just modified versions that you saw with the Global Motorsports groom of, of James Stefranis' team racing, finished second in her GT champion. 2014, you will see those exact cars, the GT3 LMS Ultra, Audi R8s competing right beside the Cadillac CTS VRs, Porsche 911 GT3 cars, all in the GT category, the Pearly World Challenge. Let's listen to the highlights of the Audi LMS Cup race at Macau. Macau was the destination for the 2013 Audi R8 LMS Cup season finale, with the championship set to be decided in the very last race. The track is the only street circuit of the series, and at 6.2 kilometers is also the longest of the year. Championship leader Alex Young's crash in qualifying made for dramatic viewing, though the car's safety cell remained intact. Due to the unique challenges of the circuit, it's usual in Macau to have a safety lap followed by the formation lap, though the cars line up one by one instead of the usual two by two. No major drum at the first corner of the race, but all the cars of course had wet tires and the weather conditions were clear for all to see. Paul sitter Eduardo Montara drove very consistently at the front of the field and looked untroubled as he sought to continue his winning streak in Macau into a fifth straight year. Behind him, local driver Andre Couto was also looking good for a podium finish early on. But the championship all rested on whether Adelie Fung could beat the rest of the field, with guest drivers Mortara and Kuto not able to score points in the overall series. Behind Fung in third, reigning champion Marchi Lee was pushing Frankie Chung hard for fourth. As Lee continued to apply the pressure, the pair was right behind Adelie Fung in third. Lee took Chung on the inside here, leaving Frankie with nowhere to go, and that opened the door for Lee to take a run at Fong. In a dramatic close to the race as Marchi gave it everything, Fong knew that if he conceded third place, the title would go to Alex Young. But Fong held on. Mortara crossed the line in first to take the win. Kuto came round for second, and Fong kept Lee at bay to take third place, and with it the title by a mere two points. The race was won by Eduardo Mortaro. He was in the, that name is familiar to the American race fan, he was in the Audi R8 that won at the Rolex 24 last year. He's won, I think it's six, it's six straight races now, including his uh, great wins in Formula 3. Uh, he's obviously a great driver and part of the DTM, right, Jeff? Yeah, he competes full-time in the DTM in an Audi R5. It's great to see him come back to Macau. They call him Mr. Macau, getting those three straight wins, or sorry, six straight wins now. Uh, you said before with Formula 3, he does it in open wheel. He does it in the sports cars at Macau. They also have a motorcycle race at Macau, the old TT. John McGinnis, uh, my buddy, running the TT motorcycles on Macau. You think it's tight in cars. I can't imagine it doing it on a TT motorcycle. Let's see if we can get Eduardo onto a, a TT bike and maybe he can win in all the categories that race out at, at, at Macau. <laughs> Mr. Macau. Let's get an idea of who he is now. In a way, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Swiss. I was born here, always, uh, always stay here. I grew up here. I have all my friends, my family. My father is coming from Italy and give me his Italian nationality like my mother did with her French nationalities. I'm proud to be a little bit every, every one of them. There is not only racing in, uh, in life and I'm willing you know, to, to have a, a nice career but in case it's not working you, you need to be ready to, to have a, a B plan. I went to university 
and uh, started, uh, started uh, economy. I couldn't uh, finish my, my license because I was quite busy with, uh, with, uh, with mainly racing. It's always difficult being a race driver but also a student. It's the life I choose and uh, it's, it's good like this. I mean, it's my choice and it's okay. I want one day uh, to, to, to become a DTM champion and uh, my dream is um, to, to continue evolve as, as a driver and uh, as a man. I want to be first uh, a good man first and, and being a, a good driver and I, I think that's, that's the most important thing. Great driver, Mr. Macau. I hope he gets caught up in the DTM this year. Let's look at the World Touring Car Championship. That was also at Macau this year, a brutal race. We'll look at it when we come back. This is the Racing Insider. This segment of the Racing Insiders was brought to you by GoRacingTV.com. For racers, by racers. Want to keep up with all the racing action at the track? Well, download the new Go Racing TV iPhone and Android app. And remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Back to the Racing Insiders right now. Let's continue our coverage of the Macau Grand Prix. Jeff, the World Touring Car Championship, ran two races on that little tiny track. How'd it go? Yeah, I'm actually surprised I got two races in, round 23 and round 24 of the World Touring Car Championship at Macau. Round 23, some carnage, but not as bad as 24. Yvonne Mueller and his RML Chevrolet able to take the win in round number 23. Going on to the race, round number 24, we had Carnage at the very first lap. Tom Chilton mixed up with that, the Aon uh, Ford. He had a, a lot of problems. His buddy Max, his brother Max Chilton racing in Formula One this weekend in Texas as well. They uh, major Carnage there. Only 15 of 33 cars were left running at the end of round 24, but it was Rob Huff able to continue uh, his victory this year, getting his fourth win this year in his Seat Leon. And uh, really the, the highlight of this race has got to be the Carnage. They had two red flags stoppages to get this cleaned up and nine drivers are being investigated by the FIA for an uh, incidents in round number 24. I don't think you can get much more of a melee than a world touring car at Macau. You know one thing Jeff that you always see that on the late night shows when they want to sh get laughs they try to show rally cross where the cars are especially old rally cross or amateur rally cross where the cars are rolling and tumbling around and they also show the World Touring Car, where these cars bang into each other, burst into flames uh, sometimes, not all the time, but it's just an enormous, an enormous uh, collision, catastrophe in a lot of these races. You think that uh, these cars are getting too fast for the little track at uh, Macau? Yeah, I think so. I think it's starting to turn into a safety issue, having these big cars, and there are big cars. I mean, you think they're just kind of sport compact cars, but having those big cars on that type of a track and as tight as it is, I mean, there's a section of that track that's 75 foot wide, and there's a section of that track that's 12 foot wide, and you're trying to put a, an 8 foot wide car through that. It's just not going to happen. And those guys, they try to put two cars side by side through 10 feet of track. It's just not really ideal racing situations, but hey, that race has been around for 60 years. It's not going anywhere. I think World Touring Car is gonna be there to stay, and you do get, I think the best part about World Touring Car is you do get your highlight reel of accidents for the entire year at one race. You know, the, the, yeah, you, you mentioned that. I was thinking maybe that they'll pull out, but uh, between the races at Zhuhai and Shanghai and Macau, a lot of the manufacturers want to show off their wares in Asia so that they could sell cars to people on Monday. So I guess just the next time you drive down an alley, 
Just imagine cars going 10 times faster than you're going side by side and imagine how close the, uh, the confines are. It's a very, very narrow track in some Asians, but in some places, but the manufacturers want to be there, so they're probably going to continue to be there, right? We're going now to talk to John Doonan, director of motorsports at Mazda. It was one of the headlines this week, in addition to the testing headlines at Sebring and Daytona. We have a special headline, Mazda introduces a P2 car in the prototype category for the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. John, congratulations on this car and especially your advancement of technology putting a diesel engine in the car. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back on the Racing Insider Show. And you're right, it is a game-changing announcement. I think that was part of the headline. Uh, and uh, we're really excited to be able to announce a two-car effort uh, for the new 2014 championship. It's been a long time coming. We have so many folks that have worked extremely hard over the last couple of years uh, to bring this to fruition, and now we can talk about it emphatically and prepare ourselves for our debut at the Rolex 24. Do, were you testing? I didn't see you in the numbers. Did you take the car to the tests at Sebring or Daytona? We did not participate at Sebring over the weekend, and we're not going to be at Daytona this coming week. Uh, we have been testing. Uh, it's Mazda testing only. Um, we'll be at all the facilities, Sebring and Daytona, um, but we're, uh, we're not going to be at the public tests until the roar before the 24. Uh, which gives us a chance to put miles on the cars, uh, break things, uh, you know, try to do what we can to get prepared and be ready for the, the full season. Well, we spent uh, last week, John, down at Buttonwillow, Bill and myself, I was one of the judges for the MX-5 Cup. Do you have a list of drivers that you're looking at already, or is this going to be a customer program? Or, you know, Joey Bickers did one at MX-5 Cup shootout. Is this possibly to have a ladder system for guys to move up with the ultimate being in the P2, uh, the Mazda prototype? As you know, Mazda, for, for many years now, frankly since 2007, has trying to be the industry leader with a motorsports career ladder to allow young drivers to develop their career in Mazdas or Mazda-powered cars. Uh, we've been very organized on the open wheel side with the Mazda Road to Indy, and we've been providing scholarships on the sports car side, as you said, from grassroots racing, uh, like the shootout last week at Button Willow, up to MX-5 Cup, sometimes into the Continental Series, sometimes into Pirelli World Challenge. And uh, future announcements coming, but uh, the same type of organization you've seen on the open wheel side is a key part of our strategy on the sports car side. And uh, we're really proud of what we've done so far. We're excited to eventually, once we refine the package and show its reliability, to have customer teams uh, in both the United Sports Car Championship, the Tudor, the Tudor Series, or potentially World Endurance, or uh, the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which Mazda, as you know, has a rich history there. Well, that was my next question, was looking at Le Mans. I know we won that, and uh, Mazda won that in 1991. Uh, and any, any thoughts about having a factory Mazda program for Le Mans? Would this be strictly a customer-based program for Le Mans? Well, the way that the ACO and the FIA have established the regulations for uh, the World Endurance Championship, as well as Le Mans, uh, they look at LMP2 as a customer category. Uh, if you look back at Mazda's history at Le Mans, that's really where we started in that sweet spot of the C2 class or the LMP2 class. And so as we look towards hopefully going back to Le Mans someday, uh, all with the intention of selling more Mazdas and telling the Sky Active story and how it relates to the road car. I mean, in the end, this engine in the LMP2 uh, format, or in the case of the Tudor series, uh, is a prototype is, is very close to what we ran in the GX car last year. And uh, that, in fact, was, was over 50% production components, uh, which is, in the end, uh, what we're trying to do here is, is put the Mazda brand out there and sell more product. Thank you, John Doonan, director of Mazda Motorsports. Thanks for having me, guys. We look forward to being part of your show in the future and certainly the series in 2014. Let's go to the uh, Sebring test, the Tudor United Sports Car Championship. 
uh, they're testing Joao Barbosa Action Express in the P category, the prototype category, in a DP car. They've been upgraded. But, Jeff, you found out that some of those times are not necessarily. He was among the fastest cars in the test at Sebring, but some of those times don't really compute when uh, you get the rest of the field with the, with the program. What do you find, what'd you find out? Well, yeah, the Action Express DP car led both of those sessions. Not a, a lot of teams came to the test. We had 12 GTD cars. We had five uh, GTLME cars, uh, one PC car with Picket Racing making that announcement this this uh, week that they're going to run a PC car in uh, uh, Tudor United Sports Car Series with Greg Pickett Racing. So that's exciting there in their PC car. But Action Express... A 153 was their time at Sebring. If we look at the times that qualifying last year, Scott Tucker and his P2 car, which is what they're trying to base the rules off between DP and P2, his pull time was a low 151. So they're still two seconds off at Sebring. That's going to be a lot of adjustments that are going to have to be made and a lot of time to make up. Two seconds is still a lot of time. And uh, you have to wonder if the DP cars are going to be able to keep up with the P2 cars because they also have another year of development. They'll have to use their uh, Le Mans aero packages. You think you've driven on the, these tracks before. You think the P2 and the DP cars can be made competitive? I think you can get them to be the same speed. My biggest fear is a DP car weighs 300 pounds more than a P2 car. If you get these guys running side by side, all you got to be as a DP driver is, sorry, this is my racing line. You can have it when I'm done and just push mm -hmm. that P2 car right off the track if you want to or out of the way. It's really going to come down to a dogfight if you even up these cars. That uh, battle on the track is what DP cars are used to, what the drivers are used to, and the P2 cars are a lot more nimble and a lot more fragile, let's say. But they're going to have to work very hard because everyone that I've talked to says that the P2 car is just head and shoulders a better machine. Guys that have driven both of them, won races and championships in both of them, have told me that the P2 car, Ryan DeAll I'm talking about, uh, the P2 car is just a better machine and it's going to be faster. How they get those two, uh, the balance of performance for those two is going to be amazing. On the calendar this week, we've got Super GT, we've got V8 Supercars, and we'll have more from the testing at Sebring and Daytona next week on the Racing Insiders. Before we go forward with what we're going to be doing this weekend, want to bring up Eric Prill, Vice President of Communications at the Sports Car Club of America, uh, one of the strongest advocates of sports car racing in the United States. His son is having some health issues. Want you to remember him and his family as he goes forward this week as you sit down to your Thanksgiving table. Remember Eric Prill. Jeff, what are you going to be doing this week? I'll be paying attention to that V8 supercar race from Phillip Island and then also the Super GT race. It's a sprint race format at Fuji. They return back there. It's just an exhibition, but going to be exciting to watch Super GT do that as well at Fuji again. Whenever I think of Super GT, I always think about video games, just like DTM. Those big wide tires and flares and wings and how quick they are. And it's just a phenomenal uh, race. If you get a chance to look at it, take that time. That's the Racing Insiders this week. I'm going to be looking at the Super GT and at the V8 Supercars. I like those guys. Their personalities are incredible. I've talked to several of them. They're really good people. That's the Racing Insiders this week. Until next week, take care of each other, respect each other. For Jeff Leffer, I'm Bill Wood. Peace.